So that's a very, as I said, broad conceptual model. As I said, there's probably nothing particularly radical or um, you know original in some of these ideas, but organizing a ways around in which we see these the dialogues that we actually participate in for advancing um, our own research and the communities that we are actually responsible to. And so moving away from that idea, even if you're not, as Professor Saiki was pointing out, we often think about research as a very lone process. Many people start working in teams and others. But even if you're doing your own individual research, it's never you alone, right? It's all these communities that you're operating in that become extremely significant. But we have to reflect back on, well, what am I taking out of this community? What am I giving to this community? What is the ethical responsibility that I have to this community? Be it the scholarly community or the community in which you're actually doing your research. Any questions on that? It's really, really hard. Um, any questions on that? I want to move forward. I have some other sort of ideas on how we do sort of framing and looking at framing ideas. You can whatever I was wondering if you have some ancient modern for dialogical research. And uh, is it, it looks as if it's, it's a radical model. model. So is it so, or uh, has already been, or has there been earlier uh, brainstorming on, on this, this research modality? Yeah. I mean, I don't, as I said, it's not original, but putting it all together, I think, is the one sort of looking at it image wise, is something I did myself. But I think any scholar goes through these processes. And so, as I said, it's something we all do, but we don't necessarily think of it in this holistic sort of image. And I think that becomes important to see how I behave in the field affects my home institution, my writing, scholarship. All of these are, are interactive with one another. And so appreciating them and sort of sitting back and reflecting on it in a serious way, I think, is um, is, is what's significant. You can switch to that PowerPoint. Okay. So here, I want to switch our minds a little and from these sort of the broad sort of conceiving a research project and our role in that, the multiple dialogues that we participate in them. To focus a little on this idea of framing. Okay? Now most of you, as we went around the room, are some uh, are related to media studies in different ways. Um, and no doubt are familiar with this idea of framing analysis and what framing means. Um, and it has a long history in communication studies and media studies. But I want to Take it a little different. I can get into it a little, um, and I'm not going to provide you know a deep sort of methodological, methodological model of how to do framing analysis. But I want us to sort of again reflect on framing as a way of also thinking about our own dialogues and our own sense of um, responsibility um, to our our subject of study. We think of framing. We're thinking of how we read a narrative. It's how we interpret what somebody else has written. But it also implies that as a writer, somebody's going to be interpreting what you write and what you have to say. So framing is a recognition or an ability to interpret sort of hidden text, and I'll get into more details of what framing is, so, but of, of, a, of a narrative. But it's also to recognize that I myself frame ideas and information in certain ways. And so again, one has to think, well, how am I framing this? 
what frames am I using? What information am I actually ignoring? Or putting outside the frame. And in the frame that I'm presenting, am I actually misrepresenting, as this image sort of indicates a, a story? So framing works on two levels. It's how we interpret a narrative, it's how we ourselves write a narrative. So most framing analysis focuses on the first process. But very little of us actually reflect back on when I'm creating a narrative, what are the frames that I'm using? And that's what we really, one of the things we really want you to think about today is framing of my own research. And that's why going back to my Keynesian model, that's partly how we start to imagine the frame. Of these intricate responsibilities that we have. And when I say something, who is it actually benefiting? Right? Is it just myself to get tenure? Or to get my PhD? Is it the people in the field? Is there a nationalist agenda here? Or some other agenda? Political agenda? Or maybe a theoretical agenda? Am I pushing a Marxist or Baltimore studies agenda? Okay. And so doing and going potentially other ways of actually reading or interpreting or providing a narrative. Okay. So we really have to really carefully reflect on what we do. <coughs> so just as a brief example of this, I don't know if all of you follow in the United States. Most of this, unfortunately, is US oriented, so I apologize. Uh, but as media people, hopefully you're going to the headlines of what's been going on in the US. But as you might know, over the last couple of years, um, a number of American football players, African-American football players, have decided at the beginning of the game, when they played the national anthem, that they would kneel down on one knee, rather than putting their hand over, standing and putting their hand over their heart, as is sort of the standard practice, as a mode of protest against racism experienced in our police forces across the country, where there's a high rate of injustice towards African American populations, and particularly the killing of African Americans by the police. Okay? So, but people find this protest problematic, and they frame it in a certain way. One of the ways in which they reframe the protest is to sort of assert that it's actually, it's an insult to our military veterans who have fought to defend the flag, the nation, everything the military does. So by taking a knee, you're actually offending our military. Okay? But that's a frame around this nationalist idea. Right? And so the response to sort of that is to try to reassert the original frame. Right? And so, in calling out, by erasing the narrative of protest, you yourself are actually reaffirming racist ideas. Very strong language in these tweets, right? But again, how the narrative can be turned in multiple ways, right? And now the person who's actually tried to corrupt the frame is himself being called out as a racist themselves. Again, that's a very powerful response, but something, again, when we ourselves are doing work, we're often in debate with others. We're looking at sort of previous scholarship or theoretical works that we're arguing with. Are we actually reframing them in a way to make it easy to critique? Are we reframing them in a way that's actually legitimate or not? Okay. So again, 
the works that we're engaging with, we have to be careful about how we actually represent them. You know, you're familiar with this idea of creating a straw man? Have you heard that phrase before? Like an American sort of colloquial sort of statement. But this idea that you create a straw man, you know, straw hay, made out of hay, not a real man, not a real person, right? So by creating a straw man, you're creating something fake to critique, okay? Compared to the reality. So I can hold up the idea that you're, you're um, insulting vets, that that's a straw man. If you actually interview most military veterans, they actually support taking the knee. They're not offended by it. So this original tweet is actually constructing a straw man to actually deflect from. But we often do that in when we start thinking about our, our theoretical works that we hold up, we take one minor idea and make that the primary sort of thing and then critique it, how bad they are, how weak this scholar is, how stupid they are, etc., etc. But the reality is if you actually read all of their work, there's a lot more there than this little idea that we're critiquing. So when you start thinking about being in dialogue, we also have to be honest with the people that we're actually debating with. There are a lot of people we agree with. There are a lot of people we disagree with. It's easy to represent those we agree with. But how do we represent those we disagree with? That becomes a real challenge for us. So something to sort of think about. Now, here's a very basic definition of frames. I just want to go through some of the ideas of what frames are and how they sort of work here. Okay? So frames are principles of selection, emphasis, and presentation composed of little tacit theories about what exists, what happens, and what matters. Okay? So it's tacit. It's not explicit. It's often overt, or sorry, covert, right? That is, it's hidden. It's not always obvious. People don't come out and state this is the frame I'm using. So somehow we have to try to figure out what that frame is. The frames are constructed by selecting certain materials, right? Emphasizing certain events or things or words, right? and presenting them in a certain way. The order of presentation, we put emphasis usually at the beginning, something towards the end is less important, right? So that itself is part of our frame. So selection, emphasis, and presentation then become our windows into trying to interpret somebody else's frame, right? So what we see with framing is that it's rarely ever the dominant story frame obvious or explicitly identified, okay? It's tacit. It's there. Sometimes it's very explicit. We saw with that tweet, right? That's very explicit. It doesn't say, my frame is, but it's very clear what's being framed. Maybe that's one of the, I guess, advantages of tweets. They're so short, you can really pick out from there a, a book. It's much harder to figure out what people's frames are. They might have multiple frames, right? So it's, it is often, though, hidden, right? And so what we start to do is look for broad sort of themes or forms of emphasis or selection, right? What are they highlighting? What are their, their titles or their subsections? What does the headline say, right? What does the title of a chapter say? What are the subtitles that they use? Those are forms of emphasis. What's important to them, right? What, again, and also which information 
are they selecting to include? This becomes extremely important, particularly as I get into when we're doing field research. We're often, I do a lot of interviews, just informal interviews, and listening to people's stories. But people tell stories in a certain way. They frame them around certain ideas about themselves or the past or something. So how do I know what is actually being excluded? Which information they selected to include? Right? So one of the some of the things that we actually start to do when we're doing sort of a frame analysis is we look for those master narratives or themes. Um, so we ask, and again, this is partly drawn on how you read a, a news report, but you can apply this to any sort of issue. Is who are the villains? Who are the good guys? Right? And often we frame our narratives around something good, something bad. Okay? Even our own personal stories. Think about some of the Facebook or something, you know, tweets. I mean, Facebook ultimately is uh, an exercise in presenting yourself. You're creating a narrative about yourself. The type of stories you post, the pictures you post, all are somehow selected, there's a lot that you don't post, um, to give others a narrative about who you are, right? So we all participate in this. But if you start thinking about it, a lot of that narrative is based on this kind of binary of something good and something bad. All these cute little cats, right? Cute, good, right? Or, you know, a political statement. Good politics, good politicians, bad politicians. Whatever the case may be, often good and bad play into it. So right there, there's an assumption of what is good and what is bad. Right? But we have to try to read out of the narrative. Okay. So others, there's also, when you're thinking about conflict or tension within what we're studying, what is the source of that, right? How do we understand that? And then the most important sort of part is, how do we know what's not? being told. When you think of a frame, right, it's a picture frame, or a window frame. You can see through it, and we emphasize on what's on the other side of that frame or what's inside the frame, but there's a whole lot more outside of it, right? And obviously, when we ourselves are doing research and we're writing, I can, you know, I can write a book, I can write an article, I can write 7,000 words or 70,000 words. Regardless, there's a lot I'm not including. Okay. And so I've chosen to exclude some information, some ideas, some people, some stories, something, right? I've selected things to include. And so we, we have to make a selection process for why am I including this and not that? both in how I write, as well as how I read other people's narratives. And then the other is also stylistic clues. And this is something a lot of us do not pay attention to. Over the years, we've developed our own writing styles. And, um, and it's hard, I mean, it's evolved. And we don't, not always also be talking about it. Um, and so, but our own writing styles tend to emphasize ideas in certain ways, okay? So mine um, tends to throw out sort of, I call them hand grenades, and just kind of blow up and shock everybody, and then I have to go back and backpedal and explain and unpack and everything, right? And so that's one way of writing, maybe not the most effective, um, but it's a style, right, that has a way in which then certain information is brought right to our forefront. And then as I try to unpack it, most people don't even bother anymore, right? I've either totally offended them or, you know, done something else. 
So I don't even draw them into the, my narrative. So one has to think about one's own style of writing as much as what's being presented. And this also includes word choice. Okay? So I just, um, in a conversation yesterday, heard that now um, climate change is a dirty word. Okay? But we can talk about clean energy in certain circles, in certain governments. I won't mention which governments. Um, and so we can no longer talk about climate change, but we can talk about clean energy. Okay? That that is okay. Um, and so that's a change in wording. The very different implications of them, there's some commonality, but they have very different meanings and implications, right? You're always choosing words, and I'll again get into this war back briefly, okay? And then you can see this at the bottom. Think about other ways the relevant facts can be turned into stories. What are different ways in which we can tell what's happened? And sometimes, and it might be useful, and we all, I'm not the worst procrastinators when it comes to actually writing, I crunch down and just have to crank out. But some of us who plan ahead might have some time to actually create two separate narratives, right? And actually think about the possibilities of or the implications of this story versus this story. This way of talking about something versus this other one. But it also means, again, how we read and how we write. Right? 